So the first thing I learned is to disable annotations. Okay, so the first thing someone asked, which is what I wanted to start off with is, how does this fit with the previous class? You might have seen on the website, I don't know if you guys have seen, there are now two classes, introduction to data science and introduction to artificial intelligence. Yeah, I heard of that. Right. So I'll just quickly clarify what's happening here because it's confusing even to us. So our original plan was to do like a two year, four, kind of four semester program with four modules. The first module was introduction to programming with Python. Second module was, let me see if I can, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we see it. Okay, cool. So first module, you guys all remember introduction to programming with Python. Second module somehow uh, was this mathematical concepts related to artificial intelligence. Third one was supposed to be more about uh, data, handling data using pandas. The fourth module was supposed to be introduction to artificial intelligence methods. So it was four semester. These were the uh, modules or four semesters. The plan was basically these, when we, even though we were trying to introduce programming with Python, initially, I don't know if you guys remember from last August, initially we were doing a lot of mathematical programming, kind of like trying to solve mathematical problems. Like the first class, you guys tried to add up numbers, uh, who's, that were multiples of three or five less than thousand. Sometime later, you guys tried to find out the reciprocal of which number less than thousand had the longest uh, uh, repeating part of uh, the decimal in the reciprocal of that number. So we kept doing more mathematical things. So my thought was because all of you guys are good at math, we would take the math part, introduce programming through that, and then we branch into more programming then continue with more math part and do more programming. So it was supposed to be math first year, programming second year. But we quickly realized after the math of the second semester started that it was not really working out that well. <laughs> Seemed like these mathematical concepts were not being easily re well received by everybody. Lot of you were doing really well. It is impressive that so many of you could finish the final project, but there were a lot of them who were not really able to keep up. So what we decided now is to break this into two courses, or two programs. So now we have introduction to data science, which will have the first one from last time and the third one from last time, or from the original plan, an introduction to artificial intelligence, for which this intro to DA, DS is a prerequisite. And for that, this will be the first one and this will be the second one. But you guys already finished the first ones of both the courses. Now we'll be doing, now for, you guys have a very, you're still continuing in this path, but the students who are starting this year will continue in this path because you guys started last year. You're still continuing in this two year, four semester kind of method. So that's why these two are switched around for you guys. But for anyone who is starting fresh, they're starting in this sequence. So hopefully that's clear on why we have two programs and not one program and why things seem like they're in the wrong place. Is this clear to everybody or? You are in AI right now, but because we didn't talk about the DS part, we are doing the DS second part for you guys as the first part of AI. 
Yeah, this is the AI class. You are in the AI class. But you will also be studying what the DS people are going to study. So people, yes, exactly. So people who are starting now will start with this. Exactly. So topics for the rest of the year are pandas and artificial intelligence. But because we didn't complete all of the mathematical concepts, maybe we will try to have like one or two mathematical concepts sessions as well. Because I wanted to do more on statistics, couldn't finish it last year. So we'll do a little bit of that as well. So you guys are in the hybrid mode. For those of for students who are starting with introduction to DS, this is how it will look for them. But you guys are still in this mode. You are more like the seniors or the explorers. Anyway, so that's hopefully that's clear. So now let's come back to this. Most of you might have heard these words, right? Like, so does anyone want to share what you feel? What is data science? What is artificial intelligence? So that I know where to start. What do you think is data science? What do you think is artificial intelligence? Science related to I data. I think artificial intelligence is a some sort of program that is smart and can do it by itself with minimal human training. Minimal human training. Okay, that's a good one. Anyone else? So that's a good explanation of what is artificial intelligence. What about what is data science? Robots, robots are not artificial. I mean, robots are a good example of AI. Right. So robots are chatbots. Yeah, these are all examples. Training computers to do human tasks. Yeah, that's all AI. What about data science? Any thoughts? Data science is data science. I think that data science is the data that is provided to AI so that they can learn from the data. Mm. Yeah, that's typically how these end up analyzing data and making predictions. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. So data science, analyzing data to make, yes, exactly. Yeah. So data science is actually very uh, loose concept in some sense because these fields are still evolving. You guys have to understand that 15 years ago, data science as a term was probably used more in like scientific literature. Only some researchers would probably even talk about data science. These things have become mainstream very quickly. So these are still evolving. So there is no good definition or good uh, boundary for what is data science or what is artificial intelligence. Someone might consider something artificial intelligence. Other might call it predictive modeling. Someone else might call it analysis, someone else might call it data science. So there's too much overlap and very loose definitions for what these stand for or what these encompass. So for this class, we'll go with this much as the definition for data science. So I'll give you an example of where, how this thing kind of flows. I'm assuming all of you guys know what's linear equation in one variable, right? So if I say phi x equal to 10, you know what to do with this, right? Is there anyone who doesn't know what, how you could solve this? Cool, so most of you know how to solve this. Right? So this is linear equation. What stream or what kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. So what, type of, uh, what branch of mathematics does this fall under? Free algebra. Okay, so it falls under algebra. Now, if I say 5x plus 2y equal to 15, 3x plus y equal to 6, what is this? System of equations, okay. It's a system of equations. Still falls under algebra, right? You could call it now maybe more, some more names. You guys also know quadratic equations. I'm assuming all of you did that. 
So if you do quadratic equations, that could still be called algebra, right? So this is all what you learned in school, right? I'm assuming all of you have learned all of this in school. What if the number of equations increase? What if it becomes four equations in four variables, five equations in five variables? What happens then? What happens if you have like six equations in six variables? Still algebra more complex, absolutely. But can you still solve it like what you're able to do right now? There's some, yeah, there is exactly one matrix way to solve the same thing that we did last year, right? Like where you formulate the matrix from the linear equations, get the inverse of that matrix, and then multiply with this right hand side as a vector and you'll get the solution. So one method, there is no fancy other method, but can you do it with pen and paper anymore? Like if you have six equations in six variables, or at least without any pain, right? So that's where more like programming started becoming useful, right? Like so larger number of variables, or complex problems, right? So this is, I'm just charting the history of how problems evolved and how problem solving evolved, right? Like basically, so this is quite old. This is relatively new. I mean, uh, problem solving computers only started in like 1930s, 1940s. Soon it became, as programming became a key to solve problems, new types of problems started emerging. People never thought of asking questions like, will this patient be a high risk patient who would need admission back into the hospital five days from discharging? There was no way people could ask those questions 30, 40, 50 years ago. Even if they could ask, there was no way they could answer that with any of their existing tools. So because we, programs became very good at solving very hard problems in a very small amount of time, hard questions started showing up. Stock market, I don't know if you know of stock market, like where people want to buy, predict which company would do well five, five years from now, two years from now, two days from now, became a big hot topic of predicting the future. They want to predict the future. Or someone wanted to go and uh, predict like health of a patient, which patients are at risk for readmission, which patients are at risk for getting a heart attack or having some eye related diseases, again, predicting future. These kind of problems were not even conceived of as solvable, even just 50 years ago. Right? People used to predict stock market in, even in 1600s, one of the earliest stock markets is based in Netherlands. Uh, you guys might want to read about it. It's called a tulip bloom or something like that from 1600s or tulip bubble from 1600s. In fact, 1912 Great Depression, 1912 Great Depression, yeah, is more of a economic problem, not of a mathematical problem, but one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, Isaac Newton actually lost a lot of money in stock market. Of course, he didn't die poor or anything, but he put in a lot of money in stock market. And despite being one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, lost money in stock market. So predicting the future, right, right, yeah, yeah. Predicting the future is very difficult and was not even something that they considered as accessible to solving. There was a lot of emotions involved. So then new sorts of problems evolved. These are called predictive modeling problems. This set that we just spoke about. Right? This is all things that happened in maybe 60s, 70s. Even today, there are lots of emerging work happening in predictive modeling. It's kind of saturated. Same way why you wouldn't see like a different method for solving linear equations pop up every now and then. Same way why new programs are not being written to solve problems with large number of variables. Uh, predictive modeling is kind of 
getting saturated. There is still a lot of work happening, a lot of exciting new things happening, but a good amount of work has already been done. So when you know the equation, when you know how many variables are there and you can solve by hand, things are easy. If you know how many equations are there, if you know how many variables are there, you can solve by programming, things are still easy. You don't exactly know how many variables are there. You just count on certain variables being there and look at past data to predict future. Things are still manageable. Now they're getting more and more fuzzy, right? Like you don't know whether the solution is even there. Nobody could have predicted Bitcoin's rise and fall. Nobody could have predicted Tesla's rise and fall, right? Even two years ago, Tesla was supposed to die. Every other day, there would be a newspaper article saying, Tesla will just crash this year. But they survived and stock is booming. So hard to find out solutions. And then newer types of problems started emerging where they said, okay, it's no longer in the realm of human beings. So this was completely human doing with pen and paper. This was completely human programmed algorithms doing with computers, but algorithm was programmed by human. This was human intuition fed in terms of variables. So let's say, actually, let's take a simpler example. Is there a game that all of you guys or majority of you guys watch? Is, are there any games a lot of you watch? Which games do you watch? You can type chess or oh, chess. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Do you watch chess, Darren, or do you play? I play. Oh, try to learn it. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So is there any game that a lot of you guys follow? I yeah. watch baseball and cricket. Baseball. Okay. Any other, anyone else like let's pick one game so that uh, that majority of you can understand so that we can see set up some example that others chess. Okay. Two chess play, two chess, one baseball, one basketball, Roblox, tennis. Okay. G GTA. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Two blocks, tennis. Okay, two tennis. Maybe tennis will be cricket. Okay. So two words for tennis as of now. Easiest to understand is Minecraft. Believe me, it's super hard to understand. <laughs> okay, so anyone else tennis, then we can stick with it. Olympics is not a game, right? Atrio. Oh. <laughs> if one more vote is for tennis, then we'll stick with tennis for the rest of the example about predictive modeling. Basketball. Okay, one more vote for tennis. Okay, cool. So let's stick to tennis. Okay, cool. So tennis. How many of you know who the best tennis player right now is? Or who is the best tennis player right now? Federer, okay. Djokovic, okay. Anyone else who was the, who were following tennis? Djokovic, okay, good answer. Nadal, okay, Federer, Djokovic, Nadal are the top three players at this point, right? Are the great top three achievers. Okay, so who would you consider to be the best player? Serena, okay. Serena is also topmost. Venus, slightly less achiever, but yeah, great still. Uh, of, uh, in the same vein as Serena. Mm, interesting. Okay, anyways. So if I were to ask you, who would win US Open? What would your answer be? Right, so this is a predictive modeling thing. Djokovic, okay. Actually, Djokovic is also in doubt of even playing, but <laughs> Federer. Federer winning US Open. Do you know when was the last time Federer won US Open? Djokovic, okay. Okay, four to six years ago, yeah, 2016 or 2014. Error, can't predict due to the fluid dynamics of the US Open. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, so, it's, so how do you predict something like that? How do you predict whether a player will win or not? What are the variables involved? You will need to know which player is the best, who has won before. Right, so Federer has won 20 Grand Slams. Djokovic has 19 or 20 now and uh, Nadal also has 19 or 20. 
how many games have they won before? Like before, what does before mean? Oh, they have all won 20 now. Very good. Yeah, so all 20. So the, all of them have won 20 game, 20 tournaments. So how do you predict now? So one variable you what you guys were saying is okay, number of game, number of tournaments won. Performance against other players. Yeah, but See, winning a tournament doesn't mean like you are per okay. So performance against which players? Techniques. How could technique? Okay, techniques. So interesting. So another variable called technique. Okay, what else? So when you say number of tournaments, one speed. Wow, that could we could say like that part of technique maybe. So number of tournaments, one. Should I consider the number of tournaments that they won in the last twenty years or? In the last one year or in the last five years, what should we consider? Probably the last one year. Because right. really, if we talk about five years ago, maybe that player wasn't as good back then. Or maybe like Federer, they might have been God back then, right? Federer five years ago was a completely different Federer than what he is right now. So you could either be in, on the rise or you could be on the fall, right? So last year seems reasonable. Any other things that you guys can think of? So win-loss record, yeah. So that's perform performance versus other players is win-loss record. What else? And keep track of that for each person. Yeah, so this is like the chess player talking here, right? Like, did you say you're chess, uh, interested in chess? Yeah, so win-loss record and keep track of that for each person, for each game. So you can come up with like a uh, rating potential increase or decrease. Yeah. So, so win-loss record is this one. So any other variables we have been spared, uh, beating up on the same variables. Momentum variable. Yes. Okay. So that's, that's actually a very, very good thing for sports analogy. Yes. Age of the player, right? It doesn't matter that Federer is the greatest. So you can also say as like physical condition, physical fitness, Djokovic seems to have been carrying some injury recently. So number of tournaments when someone, yeah, momentum. So this is called form in sports. It form or momentum. So has he won like four games in a row in the last one week? Has he won 10 games in a row in the last two months? That's much better than winning like 20 games four months ago and losing like last six games, right? At least it looks like it's better than But, so any other variables? Yeah, age, I added age. Any other variables that anyone can think of? Any sport, forget tennis, any sport. If you had to predict the winner of a tournament in any sport, what other variables would you start involving in? Rest, okay. Home runs of a player in a team, okay. That's performance uh, or last year. I would predict now, okay, yeah, speed of the speed runner. We already got those number of sixes. Okay, that could be still against like, okay, players own performance. Let's consider that last year, career, whatever. Okay, so that's a fifth variable. Anything else that you guys, speed of pitches from pitch. Yeah, again, that's all like players performance, right? What is their performance or what is their technique? Anything else from any, any other sport? You don't have to pitch tennis, baseball, basketball. Basketball, what would you say in basketball? What would, what would be an important variable? What's an important variable in basketball for people? Number of shots. What's the difference between tennis and basketball? Biggest difference? Height, number of blocks. Team, no team, right? Yeah, so team, team strength, kind of, right? LeBron James moved from Cleveland to elsewhere just because he couldn't won, win much from Cleveland initially. Then luckily went back and won. Yeah, yeah, teams of two is, uh, even though there are teams of two in tennis, when we're talking, mostly we're talking about like singles in tennis, right? So yeah, good point. 
So the reason why we don't talk as much about team strength in tennis is because it's very rare for tennis to have fixed teams. Other than very few number of teams, most teams just last like five, six months in tennis. Right? Other than like the Bryan brothers who have probably played 100 tournaments together, there are very, very few teams that have played more than 10, 20 tournaments together. So in tennis, team strength is kind of not there. But anyways, coming back to our machine learning problem, as you can see, fixed variables, well-defined relationships are solvable. When variables are not clear, not fixed, predicting is relatively difficult. Now, if I ask different people, now, which variable is most important amongst these six variables in predicting the success of a team or of a player in winning a tournament? Which is most important variable? Own performance, okay. That's debatable, absolutely, right? Like, it doesn't matter. Like, maybe a own performance is absolutely the best, but if you run into a Djokovic who is on form, does it matter? Like, you're playing at the peak of your performance, or you're a chess fan, does it matter that Vishwanathan Anand has played for like 40 years and is in solid form, but he keeps running into Magnus Carlsen? Right, so opponent's performance is as important as your own performance in most sport. So as you swimming average of the player speed and performance against other players. Yes. So it's not very clear which variable is important. And that's why predictive modeling becomes very difficult because you don't even know which variable has to play what importance. Still, when there are six variables, you can tweak, you can build models where this variable is very important, right? Like, okay, just because Djokovic has won four tournaments in the last year, I will give him a 65% chance of winning the next tournament. Because his performance against other players is phenomenal, I'll increase his chances to 75%. His technique is pretty good. He keeps on playing forever. And his physical fitness is top notch. So maybe another 5%. Player has own performance, same thing as the top one. Team strength, nothing. So, so I'll give him 80%. Yeah. For if, uh-oh, he had a broken arm, then I'd give him a 0% chance. Exactly. Of course, that's what. But if you have a broken arm, none of these three matter. So now we'll change this, right? So there is some sort of decision making, right? Like, okay, lots of conditions, lots of decision making. And this is what is called modeling. You give weightage to each variable. The weightage is not fixed. Suddenly, if some variable has really bad value, that becomes important. So this is what is modeling. But with finite variables, when the number of variables are known, when you know what is the range of these variables, so players' physical fitness, they can either be fit or have, it, have a minor injury, major injury, out, right? If they're out, they're definitely not going to win the tournament. Yeah, or they could have a career-ending injury. Yeah, that would be very sad, but yeah, hopefully like Andy Murray, they keep coming back in doubles. So... There is range of variables. So number of variables is high. Weightage assigned to each variable is not fixed. Range of variable uh, values a variable can take is undefined. Yes, so not like electric bill. Yeah, yeah, good point. So like last year, I don't know if you guys remember, last year we tried to solve one problem. Electric bill is a predictable problem, right? Predicting the winner of a tournament is a slightly hard to predict problem. And this is where people give like percentages and or probabilities and say this player has a 55% chance of winning this tournament this year, whereas another player has like a 60% chance of winning it, right? So... These challenges were what were keeping predictive modeling people busy. How to handle this much uncertainty? So predictive modeling is also called as uncertainty modeling sometimes. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. How much do you assign? How much do you assign to a nagging uh, 
injury, right? So if you want to write an equation that says uh, something like, okay, my output of my equation is chance percentage of winning, because chance of winning as a percentage. So if this is what my equation is supposed to calculate, if it's supposed to be something like, okay, uh, 0 0.02 times number of tournaments won in last year plus 0 0.15 times one minus injured real level, injury level, right? If injury level is zero, you want it to have some points. Maybe you want to even to have like injury level is a number between zero to hundred. If they are injured, if they are out, then it's hundred. So this becomes a huge negative number and changes their percentage of winning to zero almost or less than zero. So makes it impossible, right? You build an equation like this, right? Any other variable how, that you can think like, okay, 0 0.02 times speed of the player. Maybe the first factor needs to be like 0 0.2 times. So you create an equation like this. I'm just creating a very simple looking equation. And then you plug in the numbers for each player and then you'll get a percentage of winning for each player. Does this make sense? So what? What, what, what were you saying, Jonathan? So is this equation, does this equation look like a reasonable equation to predict? I mean, it's of course terribly wrong, but does this look like a reasonable thing to predict? If you had no other way of predicting, does this look like a good approach to start off? Right? Yeah, of course, it would be terrible at predicting anything, but that's the part of improving later. So the predictive modeling, the whole thing was identifying which variables are of importance and identifying what is their weightage. That is predictive modeling. And some part of that has now become what people call data science, right? So data science, one part of data science is data analytics or modeling or predictions, whatever. That's one part. How you do it is also part of this. One of them is visualization. Other is data processing, right? You need to get a lot of data from a lot of previous tournaments, right? How do you know this point two is even correct? You might, you might want to look at, okay, let me look at last year's results. If I only consider the player's performance in 2019, and use that to predict 2020 performance and then compare it against actual performance, I will then find out, okay, is this weightage correct or wrong, right? That will give me some better way of correcting this thing. So that's kind of how you do data analytics in kind of an iterative fashion. You do first, you get some error, you go do it again, you get some error, you do it again. But currently, when we talk about data science, this is all about large data, right? You, you can't do data science. I mean, you can probably do if you have only like two players and five matches that they played against each other. It's very hard to predict from there, right? It's still an unknown thing. So assuming large data. So a lot of people, when they talk about data science currently, they talk about using large data to make accurate enough predictions. Now, what is artificial intelligence is when these variables are unknown or it is hard to identify relationship between variables and outcomes, right? Federer was playing very, very well, very, very well, very, very well. And suddenly something happened and he stopped playing well, right? So what happened? We don't know. He changed his coach. He changed, I mean, Djokovic, sorry, Djokovic changed his coach, fell down, 
went very low in rankings, but then bounced back. Same thing with Federer. We don't know what's the relationship between the variables that cause this outcome. So when variables are hidden or unknown, you could still do modeling with these things. And you no longer can write a program, can't write a program to explore. Right? Because you don't know what are the variables of importance. You don't know what is the relationship. Even if you can know the variables, you don't know what's the relationship. So in this case, that's where artificial intelligence algorithms come into picture. So this is kind of the evolution, right? Pen and paper math, programming to solve larger problems, but still using human computed human algorithms or human defined algorithms. Predictive modeling where you start using data to predict something and you keep changing your model based on how things change, right? Still human intelligence, but using a lot of machine calculations, using lots of uh, models that became converted into data science as you add some things like add few more things take, uh, that, may, that takes predictive modeling into what is called as data science. When variables are unknown, when there is too much data, when there is relatively hard to identify relationships between input and outcome, then artificial intelligence. So this is, I mean, you don't have to stick with my definition. This is some way I am introducing, or in my mind, I have come to accept the boundaries between what things are and how things evolve. You are welcome to have your own definitions. So I'll pause. Any questions? If no questions, I'll ask some questions. Can you guys think of, okay, if you can't write a program, then what do you do? Actually, so that's the misunderstanding when it's, when we say artificial intelligence has no program. Actually, you write a lot of programs, right? Most of artificial intelligence things involve writing a program. But you're not writing a program to solve the problem. You're writing a program so that program figures out the solution. When it comes to these kinds of programs, you're typing the solution and asking the computer to crunch the numbers, right? That's the basic programming that we did previously, right? That's programming. But I don't know if you guys remember towards the end of last class, we did handwriting, handwritten digit recognition, right? We had already predetermined the algorithm. We thought, okay, we will go and compute this thing called covariance matrix. We will use a training set of data and calculate the covariance matrix for that. We will try to compute the eigenvectors of that and then use those eigenvectors as the basis for identifying what's uh, uh, number one and what is number two and so on, right? Algorithm was already decided by us. That's why it is more in the programming realm, not in the artificial intelligence world, right? You decided how to solve the problem. You just are making the computer solve the problem. But here you don't decide how to solve the problem. The computer will figure out how to solve it. It uses some algorithms that we have invented, but we don't know what the end, end result will look like. So that's why a lot of people would like to think of artificial intelligence as like black boxes. You don't know why it tells you what it tells you. We will, as we explore later in this class, it will hopefully become clear. I know it's more confusing at this stage, but let me see if I can give an analogy. Hmm. Right, so you can think of artificial intelligence as more like a, Shakespeare or a Mozart, right? You know they can compose, but nobody told them what, how to compose the exact thing that they composed, right? So that's intelligence. You can associate with that, right? Nobody taught Mozart how to do whatever symphonies he did or whatever compositions he composed. Or the same thing, any artist, any painter, 
you didn't teach them that you taught some basic things and they created these things that's kind of the parallel between how artificial intelligence works you program all the pieces then you let the pieces interact with each other and build this program that solves a problem that you can't think of the solution does this make sense okay anyone else is this, if you if it's not clear maybe i'll try to come up with some other example i don't know if i can come up with good examples maybe i can ask others to come up with other some other examples to make sense of this but this distinction is important right a lot of people would like to tout and say artificial intelligence is uh, some magic black box there is actually no such magic black box uh, there are lots of uh, well known algorithms in artificial intelligence and there are algorithms that you would use only in certain situations and it would be meaningless to use them in other situations it's a very well it's a very clear path there is not much magic but once you start on that path how it gives you the solution there is some amount of uh unknown problem solving involved anyway so my question to you guys can you give me an example of what would be a data science problem from something that you have experienced some modeling some prediction problem something that you have experienced something that you have seen any modeling problem that you guys have seen or any modeling solution that you guys have seen whether it is on tv in news whether talking to your friends your parents if nobody volunteers i'll randomly call out someone's name okay making a pie chart okay what making a pie chart of what you can speak you can speak no need to type feel free to speak making a pie chart of what maybe of like um the number of people in each grade in your school or something okay that's a good uh, visualization example right so that's part of some data science anything else anyone has seen okay let me ask someone else uh, how about uh, darren any examples where you saw some modeling some data analytics even if it's on a even even if it's in a movie i don't mind like what, what, something that you have seen okay no darren someone made a project on fast food consumption among grades and genders yeah that could be a good uh, data analytics kind of thing okay okay is there something that you guys would like to predict maybe another question so is there something that you guys would like to predict I try to write a program to predict the swimming contest. Okay, winner of a swimming contest, you mean? Predict how long it will take each swimmer to swim the swimming contest. Okay, winner of a game. Okay, so that's one thing. So, how many? Does anyone think this is not predictable? if there's like standard variable like how fast it might be predictable but we can be off by a little bit we could be precise or we could just be totally wrong yeah so yeah that's that's good yeah but uh, my question is not that right like my question is do you think it's not predictable like do you think it's impossible to predict the winner of a game i'd say and sometimes yes sometimes no which means it is predictable right like if always if you can never predict the winner of a swimming contest 
then you would say no it's impossible but if you can predict sometimes then it means it's predictable so someone said when will covid 19 be over okay that's a very hard prediction <laughs> winner of an election yeah last year none of you guys saw all those red color blue color pie charts state maps race to 270 or path to 271 whatever so winner of an election so do you think it's possible to predict winner of an election okay so people think yes so you think this is predictable problem winner of a game actually so shreyan <laughs> do you mean to say whether someone is stupid or not is that what you want to predict <laughs> yeah so to be honest with you there is actually a lot of research going on into things like that is someone smart is someone going to be a criminal right so there are there is actually a lot of research going on into predicting whether someone will end up being a criminal i don't know if you have you guys have seen this movie called minority report yeah you should probably watch it's old movie may be not very interesting for you guys these days but it's actually a decent one yeah that's all right uh, yeah yeah some day yeah if you find a movie that will help the class yeah we'll watch movie in class some day yeah so these things the do you think it is possible to predict winner of a game yeah shreyan with you enough so do you think it's not possible to predict the winner of a game moneyball yeah yeah you guys should watch this movie if you want uh, it's called moneyball i don't know if all of you are uh, old enough to be able to watch this yeah so it's it's a very nice movie called moneyball it's about this uh, the origin of this field which is now called cybernetics i think of how to use data to predict winners in baseball It was, it's it's still in use it's actually being used by pretty much all uh, major league baseball teams i don't know i don't know so i don't know if that movie whether kids be under it's whether it is pg13 or what rating does it have i don't know i'm assuming most of you are over 30 maybe this yeah, it's pg13 yeah so okay, do you think it's possible to predict so i am going to say yes for this one do you think it's possible to predict when covid 19 will be over how many of you think yes for this one no. no for this one i'd say no 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 it's it's possible if we follow the um progression of the medicines and uh, vaccines that pfizer and uh moderna are creating yeah so in the first month or so of covid huh? starting right, like scientific american that's a you can think of it like as a publication they had come up with this brilliant uh, visualization where they said hey, you know what the fastest way to stop covid is like basically force everybody to stay at home everybody not not cops no no nurses coming out just everybody stay at home in 15 20 days most people who have had the virus will either just pass away and then you will recover right that's the most fastest solution obviously it's the most impractical solution right how could you stay for for like a month at home then they had like a predictive model where it says what if 1% of the people start going out and uh, interacting with people what if 2% start what if 5% start their prediction was at like 6% or 7% it no longer matters even if 93% of people will stay at home when 7% of people start going out interacting with others it takes a gigantic amount of time for it to subside of course vaccine plays a big role uh, and also people staying right there is a solution which didn't work right like they paid 1000 dollars multiple times <laughs> right is covid 19 over so this is a hard to predict or even maybe no right 
So now we saw some problems that you can and cannot predict. Yeah, so just today I was doing less programming and more pen and paper things. So I was copying this, just typing this up. Uh, Shruti, maybe you can watch the video after this. They're recording. You can uh, watch the video after this. Okay. So now give me an example of what would be artificial intelligence versus data science. Anything that you guys have seen in a movie of where artificial intelligence is at play. Avengers Age of Ultron. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's extreme artificial intelligence. <laughs> right. <laughs> Matrix. Okay. What is artificial? Oh, Matrix also has lots of uh, artificial intelligence, right? Yeah. Though Matrix is debatable, right? Because it's a program simulated to, or program that's meant to simulate reality. It's kind of not artificial intelligence. Sentient robots. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, that could be considered artificial intelligence. Squidward things, yeah, yeah, sure. Agent Smith, but Agent Smith is still within the program for a lot of time, right? But yeah, once he's out of the program, sure. So Matrix, one example, Avengers Age of Ultron. Any chess players? Who know of any games that, uh, oh yeah, Leela go, okay, Alpha Zero. So, Stockfish is an analytics engine, not as much as Alpha Star, okay. So, Alpha Zero. So, anyone know the story of Alpha Zero? Who can, who can tell what Alpha Zero is like? the rest of them. Arham Jain, what is Alpha Zero? Can you introduce the rest of the class to Alpha Zero? Oh, it's like this uh, AI that's like super good. It was made by this company called DeepMind. And I, I'm pretty sure it can also play like a couple other games. I forgot which ones though. Right. So but the yeah. other thing that it played very well and it defeated the current champion is Alpha Go. Yeah, right. Starcraft. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so Darren actually is just Alpha, Alpha Zero versus Stockfish match that you are talking about. Uh, that match is actually a very disputed match because Stockfish has a certain setting in which it performs very well. So, for the sake of simulation, the people at Alpha Zero tried to make the same platform for both Alpha Zero and Stockfish which is to say like certain amount of uh, thinking time between moves, certain number of cores. Yeah, still. So, because it's it's certain games. Yeah, but later they improve definitely. Maybe, yeah, that's what I was saying. Eight in a match, that one debatable. So that one, it was more like Stockfish was at a disadvantage, but later matches, yes. After that, there was no question. So who knows? So just to give you like, maybe let me see if I can find a YouTube video about Alpha Zero. Not again, yeah. be good if I can type. Sorry, I'm using a new keyboard. Because I'm moving, I packed pretty much all of my stuff. I'm at a friend's place into, okay, notchess.com, DeepMind. Okay, let's see videos. Let's see if we can see a very short, Okay, so let's see it. Oops, looks like that. A lot of chess blockers, chess ways. Let me see if I can. Can someone else share screen? Maybe I can give you this link address and Pavan, uh, maybe you can share screen or Austin, you can share screen. Just play this uh, video. 
have a ton of uh, chess blocking apps because I was I was uh, wasting too much time playing chess. So I'll stop sharing. If you guys can just someone can play this link and uh, share, that would be Austin, great. Can you want to try? I I pasted this uh, one URL. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Oh, there is no video here. Okay. Yes. Yeah, starting. Is that a short? Video? I don't know. Is that a short video? Is that how how big is that video? Okay. Two minutes. Okay. Okay. Let's see. If I play it. Yeah, we can see. Can you hear? No, we can't hear it. It outperformed the previous versions of AlphaGo. Specifically, it defeated the version of AlphaGo that won against the world champion Lisa Doll, and it beat that version of AlphaGo by 100 games to zero. So all previous versions of AlphaGo started by training from human data. And they were told, well, in this position, the human expert played this particular move, and in this other position, the human expert played here. AlphaGo Zero doesn't use any human data whatsoever. Instead, what it has to do is learn for itself completely from self-play. So the reason that playing against itself enables it to do so much better than using strong human data is that, first of all, AlphaGo always has an opponent of just the right level. So it starts off extremely naive. It starts off with completely random play. And yet, at every step of the learning process, it has an opponent, a sparring partner, if you like, that's exactly calibrated to its current level of performance. And to begin with, these players are very, very weak, but over time, they become progressively stronger and stronger and stronger. People tend to assume that machine learning is all about big data and massive amounts of computation. But actually, what we saw in AlphaGo Zero is that algorithms matter much more than either compute or um, data availability. In fact, in AlphaGo Zero, we use more than an order of magnitude less computation than we used in previous versions of AlphaGo, and yet it was able to perform at a much higher level due to using much more principled algorithms than we had before. I think I can speak for the team by saying that we were all pleasantly surprised by just how far it went, that eventually it was able to surpass all of our expectations, and it was able to actually climb up the ratings until after around 40 days we found that it had actually defeated all previous versions of AlphaGo to become the strongest Go program in the world. And this is all for a system that's been trained completely from scratch, starting from random behavior and progressing from first principles to really discover tabula rasa how to play the game of Go. Okay. So this one was about a game called Go. I don't know if you have seen this, but it's it's considered to be one of the most difficult games to master. Chess is difficult. Go has far more combinations possible than chess. So even to like five years ago, even the best Go programs wouldn't be weren't able to defeat the top grandmasters in Go. I think they, they have some name uh, for these guys. And the uh, player that uh, this professor was mentioning in his video is Lee Sidol. He was considered to be the greatest of Go players, even amongst Go players. And this game bet him eight games to one, or, and then he played like 100 games and he lost all of them. As he was explaining, what it did was initially with data, Initially, they started with using all data about all previous Go games that they could find from like top players. Of course, they didn't use everybody's Go games data. They looked at it and then the program learned how would a human behave in this position in this game? And it started playing like that. So it learned the best moves for every possible situation. Of course, you would think that that would be a gigantic set of combination of, of data, but that's where machine learning comes into play. It's not memorizing the best move for every possible combination, it's learning. So that's where you don't have to store tons and uh, petabytes of data. Otherwise it, it's just huge amounts of data. So first it learned by looking at how humans played. Then they realized because humans don't always make the best moves in every possible situation, right? Like. Sometimes they will make a move that is deliberately weak. 
so that the other player falls for like some trap, right? This is common in human play. But computer has to make the optimal move every time. So what they did is a new type of artificial intelligence. I think Aditya had demonstrated a similar thing last year uh, towards the uh, end of uh, first semester, where he tried to build a program that picked a theme uh, for his visual studio. So these are called, re yeah, it's, the whole area is called reinforcement learning. And this specific area is called uh, GAN or generative adversarial networks. So in this particular mode, it's two computers playing against each other. Both are learning how to beat the other. In GAN, it's more of one trying to find out the cheat of the other. So let maybe reinforcement learning is better. So they play a game. Initially, they just know the rules. What is programmed initially is the rules of the game and what moves are allowed, what moves are not allowed, when is a game considered one, when is it considered draw, when is, uh, things like that. So you just program the rules of the game that has to be programmed, otherwise the pro computer wouldn't know. Then you start Right. Yeah, so that's what really reinforcement learning, you can do reinforcement learning with just one machine as well also, right? Like there is its prediction, you pass it back to itself and you could do reinforcement learning. Or you could do more like GAN where there is always a adversarial action. So you are trying to beat the other and the other is trying to beat you, right? So that's also reinforcement learning. So we'll get into details later. Yeah, so in, in, in very general terms, so reinforcement learning can just involve one, one machine learning as well, right? Uh, not, not in terms of like number of computers or anything, but one, eight, one entity learning by itself as well. So these are the types of newer artificial intelligence programs that are coming up where the program can play against itself, itself, itself and get better. So this is what is artificial intelligence, right? When some people talk about engines like Stockfish, Stockfish is the, is the before Alpha, Go came, Alpha Zero came up, Stockfish was the most uh, strongest chess playing computer engine. And it was based on algorithms that people had written. It was programmed completely. So that's programming versus artificial intelligence. So hopefully this distinction is clear. We can take a quick, five minute break or 10 minute break. Then once we come back, I'll go over what we will go through in this class for the rest of the session. If you guys have any questions, you can stay back. Otherwise, 10 minute break. So let's come back at like 10.47 or 10.45. Finish my program to guess the amount of time it take for someone to swim. <laughs> Yeah. No, 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 John, like those kinds of predictions are not impossible to make, right? Like the reason why the fastest swimmer in trials doesn't always end up being the fastest swimmer in the actual competition is because player performance is not fixed, right? Just because you swam once at a certain speed doesn't mean every time you would swim at the same speed, right? So it's about consistency. It's about other factors affecting you. Maybe that day morning you woke up with a headache. You are swimming much slower than what you would swim normally, right? So performance is not a single guarantee. There is no one factor that would guarantee success. And there is no one factor. You there is no way to predict like how much time because of so many factors involved you could more easily predict who would win rather than how, how, in how much time will they finish? Because that is influenced by a lot more factors than who will win. Till Usain Bolt was competing competitively, it was an obvious choice that Usain Bolt will win in most competitions where he was participating. But, at, but by what time will he finish? Like, will he finish in nine minutes, nine seconds, 9.58 seconds or 9.82 seconds? That's not clear. It's far more easier to predict that he will win than with how much.
anyone else any comments any thoughts you guys would like to share could you explain the difference between programming and learning again right so Let me see if I can think of an example that would make it clear. So without an example, if you extract, if you if you, as in like you, the programmer or the human, if you have figured out exactly how to solve a problem and you type up the code to actually run through the data, run through the situation and give you the answer, that's programming. That you have already done, right? Many times. Yeah. But if you don't know what is the solution, so how to solve, for example, this problem that we were talking about, or the most classic example that's given off uh, is home prices. How much would a home be sold for? You don't know the solution for that, right? Like, because you might look at data, you might say, okay, this is going to be sold for this much. This, is, this house was sold, sold for that much. In this neighborhood, there is a good school district, whatever you would, come up with certain price, but there, there is no actual programming to tell you, okay, uh, exactly because of this formula, by following this exact step, I came up with this conclusion. You're looking at more of data and trying to come up with a way to predict. So there is some amount of unprogrammed behavior. So you don't actually tell it, okay, take this number, square footage of the house, take this number and see, let's say the school district's rating, and then take this number, which is the uh, number of million dollar plus homes that are in this neighborhood, and add up all these numbers and get the answer. You are not doing that. You're giving computer lots of data and saying, okay, this is all the data I have about home sales in this area. Now I have a new home that I would like to sell. Go look at whatever else you can look at and figure out what should be the price of this. And then it starts going and looking at it. Okay, I have seen similar sized homes, similar school districts, similar wealthy neighborhoods, similar uh, number of bedrooms, uh, renovation, whatnot. It will try to look at whatever variables it can look at and try to come up with its own value, uh, formula for giving you an answer. You didn't tell it the formula. It is coming up with the formula by itself. I don't know if that's any more clear. Anyone else if would like, if it's not clear, anyone else would like to take a shot at uh, trying to explain differently. I think I actually get it now. Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. cool. Another example that I was giving you, right? Like. If you take a painting class or an art class or a music class, obviously no one is teaching you. They're all teaching you like which keys, how to do, or what kind of strokes, how much paint to use or whatnot. But nobody is telling you how to compose a new song, right? You know the pieces necessary to compose a new song or you know the steps necessary to paint a new painting, but nobody told you what to paint, how to paint. Like this is what you would you have to paint. Using the pieces that you learned, you are painting or you are you are uh, composing something new. That's intelligence, right? Same thing in program. Using pieces that humans have programmed, if it figures out some new solution or if it figures out a new a new insight or if it can predict something differently, that's what is artificial intelligence. Okay. 
Okay. I'll also go get some water in two minutes. Well, you could do eleven thirty eleven part five. Oxar should actually not by itself exactly must be. Ah, could do Oxar is checking for chest and then a good play. Oxar checking the one. Are they the chairman? Okay. Okay, so hopefully everyone is back. Okay, so so in this next uh, eight, nine classes or so, what are we going to learn? So first thing, as I said, like in data, with data science, you need to have data, right? How many of you have used some data in your programs previously? Oh, sorry, I got the screen share. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, cool. So 
how many of you used data in your in any programs or in any context that you have used previously okay so maybe i'll go a little slowly about this one so let's the movie homework assignment in last semester oh yeah you guys used data right yeah i forgot yeah that was actually a lot of data that you guys used okay so that's a good one yeah thanks for reminding me okay so now that most of you have actually seen that one so let's stick to that movie homework problem from last year for those of you who don't remember what we were doing is basically trying to find out the most successful movies from a given year actor who acted in the most number of uh, top 100 movies or top 100 highest grossing movies does anyone remember who was the actor i don't remember either now Yeah, so that's using data right using data we were doing some answering certain questions there is no prediction there we are just answering questions using data so one of the things you might remember is when you want to use data in your program to make decisions you need to first get data or read data right So the first step is to actually get or read data or load data into your program. Does it make sense? If you want to use data, you should first get it right. Yeah, I'm screen sharing. Can you not see? Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So the first step in data processing is like. get data or read data right oh okay cool okay yeah if we are recording this you can use it uh, you can use it afterwards like if you feel like some parts were not clear so first part is getting or reading data the second part is what most of data processing is is about processing or cleaning up data what do you think is involved in why do you think we have to process or clean up data you already did this in that movie problem if you remember what do you mean by processing data did you filter do you remember did you filter yeah so you tried to get what you needed right okay based on certain year you filtered okay but you also did more than filter you actually started finding out within that movie json movie json data which part is actor and what is the actor id and what is the actor name and so on right like their department and so on so lot of uh, processing the data to get what data you need right so that's processing what do you think is cleaning up of data any guesses right so one problem is formatting ordering probably not so when we say formatting is a problem let's say you have a website an api through which you can get data and sometimes that api returns a date in month date year format and other times it returns in date month year format and some other times it just returns in this format month and year 
So how can you handle all three of them in the same way? You can't use all three of them without changing to some single format, right? Does that make sense? Like if you're trying to find out the average age of students in your school or average age of students in each class in your school, you would like to know everybody's birthday, right? And the birthday should be in same format. If one person's birthday is month, date, year, and other's birthday is date, month, year, what do you do? So what should you do if it is like this? If this is exactly how you have your data. So if you, let me see. So you're trying to find out the average age of kids in a particular class. And this is how their birthdays are. Okay, I'll just write it here. So let's say the birthdays are like this, 1, 16. Okay. Pretty much everything on my screen is frozen. Hmm. Sorry guys, give me a second. Can you hear me still? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, something happened as soon as I opened Excel, my computer is frozen now. Anyway, so let me continue the example. If you had like my, some date of births in one format, other date of births in other format, and in other cases, just month and year, how can you calculate the average age? What is the first step that you would do? Anyone? Change to same format, right? So well, the first thing is a formatting problem. So the first step is change all dates to same format. But what if you don't have the date at all? What if you only have month and year for some students? What do you do then? Guys, this is, if you don't share your thoughts, I know you're all super smart. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So I'm sure you can give some ideas on these kinds of things. So you're trying to calculate average age of students. You don't know the date of exact date of birth for some students, but you know the month and year. Yeah, so you know the month and year that some student was born. You don't know the date. How can you calculate the average age of students knowing that you don't know the dates for some of them. How could you proceed? So this problem is called missing data basically. So you are missing dates for some students. Right, so that one answer which uh, Sai Shriya Satya is saying is, if some students only have the months and years, for every student, just consider the month and year. That's one solution. So that's actually a common enough solution. It's called dropping data, right? So you drop some data so that you have everything that you need. This is not exactly what dropping data is, but in this example, we are dropping a, a part of the data so that everything is in consistent format. That's one idea. Any other ideas? You had a missing before the dates, but you want to calculate an average, right? How do you calculate average of missing? Any other guesses? Right, so Darren's answer. Oh. Thank you for the correction.
So one option is accept bad data and just, just accept the amount of error. So you can assume, assume that date of birth is equal to first of the month or last date of the month or mid of the month, right? Depending on how many students have this problem, you might not be very, your average may not be too bad, right? This may not influence your average too much. So you can either fill in some data. So this is called filling in data. See, all very commonsensical ideas, right? Like not magic, all simple, pure logic. If you have dates in two different formats, convert to one format common sense, right? No, no programming. But most of the times people approach this as if it's like huge endeavors of programming. It's not at all that. It's just simple common sense. You have something in these two formats, convert to one format. You have dates for some people, don't have date, date of births for some people, either drop the data or fill in the data, right? Just assume some, some date for the people who don't have a date. What else can you do other than dropping data, filling in data? Some guess from anybody, I don't mind. Just some guess on seeing. Absolutely, yeah. So you can do data gathering. You can gather data. Well, that's it. Right. See, I knew, I knew you guys are smart. So you ask the students. For those who is, whose data is missing, go ask. Right. You are not talking to a billion students. You are talking to maybe ten students. So gather the data. So that's another solution. What else can you do? Is there any other way you can gather this data without asking the students? Ask principal, good. The school's information on students, good. Ask teachers, good. The way I was thinking more of which maybe, ah, nice, look at a database. Which database? School's database, but school's database doesn't have it. That's a school's database also doesn't have it. Somehow they were very lazy administrator deleted the data. What if Facebook, what if you go to Facebook or Instagram or uh, whatever you guys are using these days? What if you use that and look for when are others wishing that student uh, on their birthday? It's called a, yeah, so social media. It's not stalking. You are using to calculate something, right? If you used to, depending on the purpose, right, you can use socially available data with good intent. Or you can be like this company called Cambridge Analytica, which uh, tried to use Facebook data and uh, make politicians who paid them money win elections. You, you could use social media even for that. Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. I'm not saying, see, none of these methods are correct methods or complete methods you have a problem, which is data is missing and bad. These are ways to solve the problem without saying, okay, I have bad data. I'll not even, I think that's the name of the company, Cambridge Analytica or let's see. Yeah, it's a British political consulting firm. Right? So these are all potential solutions. None of them is a good solution, right? 
So this is one common thing that happens in data science. That's why processing or cleaning up is necessary, right? Does this make sense? Any questions? Okay, now that you have, now that you have data and you have processed the data, what what can you do next? So think about that movie problem. Thanks to Shruti for pointing that out. So think about that moving pro movie problem. After you got the data, after you processed it, what did you do next? Compile into list and look through. Okay, so you start consuming the data or you start uh, maybe analyzing the data, right? Kind of explore or analyze or consume the data. What do you do after that? So you use the data, then what do you do? So after you use the data, what did you do? Did you just try to find out, then close the data? Sure, but did you just try to find out who was the most successful or who was the actor who acted in the most number of top 100 movies? Or did you find out like how many movies did all the actors who acted in the top 100 movies act in? Which one did you find? But did you calculate directly the top actor or did you use some intermediate step to calculate top actor? You use some intermediate steps, right? Like to say, okay, each actor, how many movies did they act? And then you sorted it. But what if there was not one top actor, but like 10 top actors, how would you know that? Any guesses? Sort the list created, but you sorted the list. The top item is still the top item. The second item and the first item are tied. How do you, how would you know that? Like you, you mean you want to sort the list and look at it or what? Okay, that's one way to sort it. But are you guys saying like you'll sort and then look at the actual results yourself manually? Yeah, my question is what if there is a tie? What if two actors or 10 actors have exactly the same things irrespective of what you do? What if there is a tie? How would you know that there is a 10-way tie or a five-way tie? I think I know how to do that. Yeah, how, the program feed out all the first place winners, no matter what. Right. So yeah. So George, Jonathan is saying, and what Shai Shri Satya is saying. Yeah, same thing. So you look at it, right? You look at the data. Uh, no, with it, my question is: Let's say there are ten actors. All of them acted in the same number of movies, did everything well, and exactly the same thing. Somehow you have ten actors who did. Let's say 10 actors who acted together in 100 movies. Now, how do you sort them? They all played equal part. They all did exactly well. What how do you sort? What I'm trying to say is like, for example, if um, if one actor acted in 100 movies a year before the second actor who's tied, that first actor who first achieved 100 movies would be first. And no, but the second actor who achieved the uh, after in a hundred movies would be second like that. Right. Yeah. My, my answer to that is like if everything is the same. There are hundred actors They acted in the same movies. All of them got equal salary. All of them got equal role. All of them got same awards. Everything is the same. So you have no way of sorting. In this case, even after sorting, they're all getting the same rank. So one answer that Shruti is giving is saying, 
Okay, look at the number of move. Look at the rank of first actor and look at the rank of second actor. If that's the same, then you are, you keep going. So what I'd like to get maybe I've deviated a little bit too far away from what I was uh, charting for is you sometimes have to visualize your data. You can't actually just print always. Sometimes you have to visually see your data. Right? You have to see what is happening. So maybe you get 10 actors who are all tied together. You can visually see that a lot more easily than to actually print everything and see. Of course, if you have only 10 people, you can print and see as well. But if you want to know what is the distribution of how these actors are performing, then you can't tell that visual uh, through prints anymore by printing the data. You'd have to draw a graph. So that's also part of data science. So you get data, process or clean up the data, explore or analyze the data, and then you visualize the data. Then you transform the data if you want. What I mean by transform is you maybe let's say you take something like uh, other than format, I'm thinking of. Mm. So let's say you want to take which of the students students in a school and uh, try to predict which of them will be good at athletics. So you might get basic data like the maybe height, weight, age of the students, or maybe how good they are at whatever sports they have played so far, but you want to predict who will be the best athlete from the school. So for something like this, you would have to take the data that you get and you have to start converting that into different methods. Maybe you need to look at the height weight ratio. Maybe the tallest kid is too lean to be able to run fast enough, right? So you maybe divide and say, okay, height by weight ratio should be like this much for us to say this kid, this kid is going to do well. So you transform data and then finally you Maybe here we can say is consume the data. So these are the steps. Again, these are not like set in stone. Sometimes you just go from the first step to last step without doing anything in between. Sometimes you go through all of them. It depends on the data that you have and the problem that you're solving. So this is what we will be learning in each class, pretty much maybe sometimes in two topics in the same class. So one, two, three, four, five, six so classes, most likely. This is what we'll be learning. Any questions? Okay. After those six classes, now, where does this data stay? Where do you get data from? So I said you will get data as the first step. Where do you get it from? Any guesses? So one answer is database, okay. Any other answers? Survey, sure, yeah, survey got you the, but where are those, sir? where is the data about the survey captured? APIs, so, okay. Database, API, so you can use APIs like what you did with that movie database. Or you can read from what is the most common thing, files. People might have created files with data in it. Any other thoughts? What types of data do you normally experience? 
So obviously all of you have seen some files or the other. You guys have all typed up some homework assignments, whatever. You have used APIs. You probably have used some databases. COVID count, yes. COVID count is a data that keeps changing. So how do you think they're getting that data so accurate so quickly? So that's called streaming data. States give it and they sum it up. Yeah, but they don't all give it at the same time. They, they keep giving it at different, different times. Of course, this COVID data is a far smaller problem. But if let's say you're Facebook and you want to know how many people are on your app, how many people are using Facebook, people continuously keep logging in, logging out, logging in, logging out, right? So it would be a huge challenge to find out how many active users are there on Facebook, right? That involves lots of data that keeps coming continuously. So it's called streaming data. So these are places or ways in which you can get data. So you can get data from files. That's the easiest one. We will start with that. You can get data through APIs. That's the second easiest one. We will go to that next. But as data becomes large, these two methods become relatively difficult to use. Let's say you want to look at all the movies that are ever made. The data is too large to be stored in files and read from files and processed. So people start keeping them in databases. So that's what we will learn next is database. So we learn a little bit about how to create a database, how to create a table. We won't learn too much how to get data from a database. We'll just learn very basic things and maybe how to load data. So we'll learn this part next. This is because as data gets large, you want to go to a database. You can't actually do much if you are not in a database. And then finally, we'll do a project. So this is the overview of what we will be covering in the rest of this uh, class. Any questions? Okay, so for today's class, let's start with this with very, very high level quick example. But before I do, how many of you registered in this website last time? If you guys haven't registered with Kaggle previously, Please do so now. Yes, yeah, you just go to that website and register. So we'll be using Kaggle for getting the data and the, uh, and the problems that we will be solving. So let's explore some data sets that are there in Kaggle and let's see. So you guys can pick, I'll just scroll through data sets. You guys see which data set is of interest and then I will show how to load that data set into a program. So these are the top eight data sets according to somebody. So flights in Brazil, is that interesting to you guys? Alibaba stock data. Okay, you can look at and tell me if any of these eight things that you see here are of interest to you. If not, I will show more. 
Indian government to prevention of COVID-19 in 2020. Okay, let's see how much is this. I have no idea. Okay, oops. Okay, so what are they giving here? Oh, this is just, what did the government do? Three airports started screening, seven airports started screening, something else happened. This is just a list of what the government did. So nothing great, really. Just like news. They took the news and they compiled it. Someone was very much interested, so they compiled it into like JSON. So it's action taken and what date. Okay, Olympic Games 2021 medals. Let's see if the data is there. Okay, so let's see. Maybe this is more interesting. 120 years of Olympic history. So let's see what does this data have. So this one just says country, number of gold medals, number of silver medals, number of bronze medals, and total medals, rank, and some code. Okay, so this is a very simple data set. What does this have? Okay. So this has some four data sets. Okay. So we'll start with this one. Very simple one. Any objections to starting with this data set or do you guys still want to look at more data sets? So I encourage you to go and look at this. So register to, for this website. I'll write down that as homework. First part of homework for today is uh, register on Kaggle.com. If you, if you don't already have it, explore data sets. Okay, so that's and then I'll see how I can verify whether you explored or not. Maybe I'll ask you to like summarize something or write down something about the data set you explored. Okay, anyway, so our, we decided to explore this data set. So I'm going to download this first. Yeah, that's what I'm showing. Explore just means go read about the data set. That's Yes, yes, In, yeah, that's what we'll get to. We don't worry about the homework part, we'll get to the homework part. I'm trying to add this file here so that I can. Show you how to start with this process. So we have Tokyo 2020 data set. So just so that you guys know, this format, this file is in a format called CSV. I don't remember. So this file is called as CSV, comma separated values. If you'd like, we can open and see this. So this is it, right? Like you guys saw similar data in last classes as well. So it has title or what, values are present in the first column and this first row. And then 
value comma value comma value and so on right so very simple format and very small amount of data right so we will see how to note this data so first thing is i'm i'm sure all of you have used collab if not please uh, explore collab and upload this data set so first thing is there is a library called pandas which makes it very easy to deal with data so especially if you have certain types of files it makes it even more easier to read or deal with data so as you can see the first step of our data science workflow right which is getting data is as simple as one line of code because of using this library otherwise you guys might remember last year you had written code or a few months ago you had written code on how to read the data set that i gave you were reading it line by line as a string and splitting it right yes yeah i'll go through that also darren one second so it's very very simple one line code to read data any questions how do we just display uh, yeah yeah we'll get there so the first things to know is when it reads this csv file right it is reading that data where is it storing it has to hold that data right like in a list or in an array or whatever in a list or a set or a string somehow it has to hold that data somewhere in the memory so we need more like a data set or a data collection what collection holds this data right so for pandas when you call this read csv method yeah see the description says it reads a comma separated file into what is called as a data frame you can think of a data frame as a n dimensional or a two dimensional or three many dimensional array so we can say tokyo olympics data frame so now i read into this nothing so it now read into this one now if you want to see what it read you could use two very handy commands called head and tail so head displays just the top five rows and what would do you think tail would display last one okay cool so let's see last one right yeah so last one you can tell this head and tail tail functions extra numbers so if you if i say tail of 15 it will show 15 last 15 if you want last place you could just exactly last x rows so if you want to know who is the first one you could just say head of one of course that would be bad because there are other ways to access data all it is doing is it's returning the these rows returning the first n rows and it's displaying nicely as a table here so what did we do so far very simple stuff right like we didn't do that much yet or at least doesn't feel like we typed a lot we got a data set in a csv format uploaded it into our collab environment read the csv file and we are looking at the data so head detail in different sizes now think of some questions what would you like to do with this data so 
we have Olympics data set. Is there something that you guys are curious about this data or this data set? This file is called data set just because it's a collection of data attributes. I want to know how many total medals were given out. Okay, so one question that Jonathan wants to know is how many total medals were given out? Okay. Anyone else curious about anything else regarding the Olympics medals? So only Jonathan wants to know something. Nobody else has any interest in Olympics. Distribution of gold, silver, bronze medals. What do you mean by distribution of gold, silver, bronze medals, Darren? There will be one of each, right? Like unless some sport has which country and a graph of some sort. That is already there. How many medals USA one is already there in the data set, right? Like USA one, 113 medals, 39 golds, 41 silver, 33 bronze. Okay, but that's also a good question. How many medals did a particular country win? Okay. Which player? We don't have player level data. We only have country level data. But Darren, like, going back to Darren's question. Which country earned the most? Okay. Okay, which country earned X amount of medals? Okay, some more questions. So, which country earned highest gold medals? Highest silver medals? So, obviously, the answer need not be the same for each of these, right? Like the highest gold medals, obviously, is United States. Maybe even everything United States is the answer. Uh, looks like it. Looks like we might be asking a very bad question because the answer is always going to be the same. Yeah, so looks like US is the answer for all of these, but it doesn't matter. We should explore and write a program to do that. And then which country won X amount of medals? Okay, so good enough. Four questions. So I'll I'll write some program to show how to do the first two questions, and then I'll add maybe more questions and that will be your homework. So let me see if I can write some code to say how many total medals were given out, right? So I have this Olympics data frame, right? Now this is a like a list or like a two dimensional array. What should I do with this? So how do I calculate the total medals? Can you index by total in a data frame? It is in this data frame, it is luckily indexed already by total. Yeah, you can add the totals of every country. So loop and add, right? That's it, right? Nothing fancy. Could you go up for one second? Yes, I can go up for one second. Okay. What do you want to see? Oh, the first cell all the way at the top. Oh, no, no, don't try to do this now because uh, I'll, I, I I would like to like finish sooner today because I have to leave. So I'll share this collab book at the end of this class, then you can uh, do it at, at, at your own pace. So our idea, basic idea is to loop through a data, loop through this data, add up the totals, right? 
Is that the basic idea? Yeah, yeah, I have to write some more time. Any other idea that you guys can think of? Okay, so as I said, this is like a table. So you can say for country in Tokyo Olympics data frame, you can say or dot rows. So this is how you could iterate through rows. Oh, I'm moving to West Lafayette in Indiana. Oops. Data frame dot rows. Let me Let me write rows. So it got me something and it printed me something that looks like it started. So this is like a row. You would say in this data frame through this row. So we are going through each row. Now within each row, if you want to access the total column, you would say something along these lines. You are familiar with this convention, right? Like this is the same as array convention that we were using or lists. Previously when we were using lists, this is the same convention that we are using. So let's see if we can just print the total by each country. So this is two things here. This returns index and country. So, so this is by the total for each country as it is reading. So 113, 88, whatnot. Then we just need to add this up, right? So total medals. So this is the total medals. Oops. So the total medals is 1080. So this is a very short program to read a data set. Basically, if we were to do all of this back to back, it's just an extremely small program with maybe four lines of code. Does this look straightforward? Any part of the program that you guys are unable to follow? Okay, cool. Okay, so another thing that because these kinds of operations are relatively common, another thing that is extremely frequently done is in these kinds of pandas like libraries, you could actually what is the country of total? This is like a, a list convention, right? If you remember, previously we used to do something like this. In a dictionary, if you, if you assume country as a dictionary, we are accessing the value in this total column. Okay. So, one of the key uh, big advantages with something like pandas is you don't even have to write this much in terms of code. You can just say this of total dot 
sum. So I don't know if you can see, but uh, it's printed the same result, right? 1080. So with just three lines of code, you could calculate basic things. Of course, it's not a hard thing to calculate, right? It's just number crunching. But it's very, very small number of lines of code to do something that looks reasonably large. Now let's see if we can do some code for this. How many medals did a particular country win? Actually, let's skip that one because that one needs the idea of filter, which uh, probably not right now. This one, which country won? Yeah, all of these are more filter-like questions. Yeah, actually, let's see more of these data exploration-like questions. Maybe let's talk about some question like, which country has the rank by, by rank, change country of total to gold medal. Okay, obviously you can change. Yeah, so interesting question, but what is the answer? Do I have to do total and do I have to sum up gold medal separately? What, what is the total number of gold medals? Can anyone take a shot at guessing? Any guesses? Okay. Yeah, exactly. But didn't work out so well. So what went wrong? It intuitively it looked like number of gold should be one third of number of uh, medals. What went wrong? Number of golds are almost the same as number of silvers, but number of bronzes are beating the number of golds and silvers. So this is something that we wouldn't have guessed, right? If we were not, if we wouldn't have looked at data, we wouldn't have guessed that this is, yeah, nothing is wrong. It's just our initial gut feel seemed like these three should be equal because every sport will have one gold medalist, one silver medalist, one bronze medalist. But some silver medalists get off, uh, get caught in drugs. Uh, they get their medals taken away. Sometimes there are probably two winners of a bronze medal, tied matches, things like that. For some sports, maybe award just two bronze medals without actually a chance for a tie, even if it's not a tie. I mean. So yes, this is the basic story. So we start, load our data set, and we can do some computations or we can iterate through our data set and do some other computations. Yes, some countries don't have any medals at all. There are countries that don't even show, show up on this list, right? So I'll, I'll write up some more summary of how you can do exploring the data. Feel free to use Google. There are tons of articles on how to use Pandas. I will even find one article that I think is short and sweet. You guys can read that and then answer some basic questions on this data set. So quick recap of the homework or let's finish the homework. So first register on Kaggle, explore data sets. What I mean by explore data set is you, you have to come and describe like a short report on the data set that you explored. What is it about? What data is there in it or whatever? Don't copy paste please. And then uh, set up Google Collab. Oh, read the article about uh, Pandas, set up Google Collab and uh, using Tokyo Olympics medals data set, answer certain, answer some questions. Okay. 
two of these most of some of you have already done two of these so there are no there are there will be no points for that so there will be some points for this maybe 20 points maybe 40 points for this and 40 points for this okay so 20 40 40 100 Okay. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, we'll send all of this. Uh, they'll upload onto AMC website. How will you know? Yeah, that's why you have to write a short report on the data set, right? Ah, uh, yeah. So this is a good question. When will the homework be due? When do you want the homework to be due? Oh, you're talking about the pandas one. Yeah, good point. How will I know you wrote this? I don't want you to make two reports. So, okay, read this and then I'll give hard enough problems that if you hadn't read it, you wouldn't be able to solve. Thanks with you for pointing out. Well, the reason I said explore data sets is because I want you to be familiar with this website. We will use this website more and more. Yeah, I would like to use this website more and more. So please get familiar with this website. That's why I wanted you to get uh, go, go to that and explore something. So yeah, read this article. You don't have to write too many reports. This one can be like as short as like 10 lines. Right. So yeah, no report on pandas because that will be too long and you will be reading a lot large article. You can keep going back to that any number of times you want. So use the use that article to solve these problems. So I'm reducing your writing burden. Don't feel bad. Okay. So is this Clear? No, we are in a programming class, right? We are not in an English class. The other thing by next class, maybe I'll have, I'll find an article on how to do this. For those of you who know how to do it, please go ahead and set up your GitHub account. <laughs> yeah, we can also start English circle. You can set up. If some of you have it, great. If if you can try, what are we? What is GitHub? GitHub is more like a code repository. So once you finish your homeworks, you can upload it to GitHub and share with us. You don't have to actually upload online to AEC's web portal or whatever. And we'll see if we can score somehow nicely from there. So that's the advantage GitHub is more, I can think of GitHub as like a big, uh, Google Drive for programs. That's a little bit more than that, but actually it's a lot more than that, but uh, that's the simplest analogy. Right, right. Yeah, they, they have been sharing on Google Collabs. One of the problem is they forget to enable the sharing settings. Uh, we have to then ask for access. They submit on Friday night. Yeah, so that's why with GitHub, it's uh, very easy to share. And also they can share more publicly, right? Like you'll have your own portfolio. So basically at the end, by the end, when you're done, you'll have like some seven to 10 programs and maybe one big project. You'll have something to show others. But this is not required. You can do it. Otherwise, next class, I will see by next class, I'll see if I can find some uh, article that is simple enough and that shows basic GitHub setup. Right. So that's pretty much it for the first class. If there are no other questions,
we'll finish it 12 minutes ahead of time. Okay, cool. Any questions? <laughs> When is the homework due? When is the homework due? Excuse me? I think he's gone. I don't actually know what he said. Uh, yeah, usually we do uh, next Tuesday the homework is due, but Karthik asked this question, when do you want yeah. the homework to be done? So. Sorry, I'm back. Yeah. So if, uh, when do you want the homework to be due? Normally we have tried Tuesdays, but there are only 20 of you this time. Actually, are there even 20, maybe only 15 of you. So if you want more time, it doesn't matter as much, but don't ask for extension. Once you pick more time, just stick to the time and submit. So it looks like there are only 13 of you. So we don't need too much time to correct. I think we by, can we submit it by like next class? Then when will we grade? We want to go get into this habit so that by the time you come back in next class, your grades are already uploaded and uh, uh, solutions are already there. You would have even reviewed the solutions and okay. come to the next class. Because last time we spent too much time going through solutions, which is good. But in this class, most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about you can definitely find in Google. So I would like to spend more time on problems than on solutions. Wait, then, then Wednesday maybe or Tuesday. Okay, Wednesday or Thursday. So Thursday afternoon or Wednesday night, that's good enough. That gives us like one and a half day to grade and we can upload solutions by Friday night. So either Wednesday night or Thursday afternoon, you pick one. Thursday afternoon. Okay, cool. So Thursday afternoon, which means because there are so few of you guys and I'm assuming only the motivated few have joined, no extension beyond that. If you submit after Thursday afternoon, we'll just give you zero. Okay. Because last time we kept dragging a lot. I mean, some homeworks, we couldn't even grade three weeks after the submission because still people were submitting. Okay, cool, super. So let me write that also down here. And this will be fixed for whatever the homework is. So Thursday afternoon, the week after. Now, yeah, Vidyat, so one of the things that uh, I'd like to be very clear, right? Like if you solve easy questions easily, the amount of learning you get versus you solve hard questions and you don't complete the solution, the amount of learning you get is quite different. And we are trying to balance. Of course, we don't want to only keep giving hard questions so that you get discouraged, but there will be small number of easy questions, good number of medium questions and some hard questions. Yes, yes. Yeah. And some of these will only need time. They will not need like too much thinking because initially you have to get used to how to program. Then you can get used to how to program harder things. So please put in the effort. If you are finding it difficult to put in the effort, work with your friends. There is no restriction to say, or make friends. There are only 13 of them in this class or 15 of them. Talk to each other, work in teams and do it. I don't have a problem with that, but do it. So I'll also mention that in work is all right. Just make sure you submit your own homework at the end. Don't submit together. Okay, cool. Thank you, Karthik. Thank you. Goodbye.
to subscribe and like. If you have any questions, you can email info at agoramagical.org or comment below and we'll reply back. Maybe. And if you want to see practice things or anything about us, you can visit our website, which is basically the end of the email, but without the info and the end. So bye!